This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click the show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Hayward Cho, and I am the General Manager of ADR Services, Inc. Today, two of our very own, Monty McIntyre and Mike Roberts, will go over with you the important new California civil cases published in 2022. Please allow me to introduce our two speakers. First, we have Monty McIntyre. Uh, Monty is a mediator, arbitrator, and referee with ADR Services who helps settle cases as a mediator and conducts focused hearings and issues fair and impartial decisions as an arbitrator or a referee. Monty handles cases in the areas of business, commercial, employment, insurance, bad faith, bad faith and coverage, real property, and torts, including elder abuse, medical malpractice, personal injury, and wrongful death. Monty brings extensive civil trial experience to his work as a neutral, having represented both plaintiffs and defendants in a wide variety of civil cases in the aforementioned areas. Monty has been a member of the American Board of Trial Advocates since 1995, is a, pre is a past president of the San Diego County Bar Association, and is also a past president of the San Diego chapter of ABOTA. Finally, Monty is a publisher of California Case Summaries, or the publisher, which provides annual, annual practice area, quarterly, and monthly civil case summaries of every new civil case published each year by California courts that can be read in minutes, organized by legal topic with the official case citations. Next, we have Mike Roberts. Mike uh, has been a full-time neutral for the past 30 years. He has served as a mediator and special master in over 4,000 cases with an aggregate settlements, uh, with aggregate settlements in excess of $800 million. His mediation practice consists primarily of major financial controversies and complex multi-party matters in the areas of employment, construction, business, real estate, and insurance. He has been named as one of California's top 50 neutrals and is a frequent author and speaker on various topics related to mediation, negotiation, and other forms of dispute resolution. All right, Monty and Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hayward. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with everybody and uh, we will start going through this. So thank you all for joining us today. What Mike and I are going to do is we're going to go through some important new decisions. Now, there are many cases published by the California courts every year. I've been keeping track of them for a number of years now. And on average, our California courts, Supreme Court and Courts of Appeal, publish about 500 new civil cases every year. So that's a lot of new cases. Last year, they were just under, they were 472 new civil cases. And so there are more important cases published last year than we'll talk about, but we're gonna try to cover a number of cases during the time that we have today. Um, and what's significant about California law is that these decisions often are significant new decisions in different areas of law. For example, other than Code of Civil Procedure cases, the most published opinions last year, and this is pretty common, were torts and employment. And those are areas where lots of things are happening all the time. So Mike and I are going to take turns talking about these cases. And Hayward uh, and Mike, just keep a look at if these slides don't advance, then let me know and I'll do something different. So the first slide uh, dealing with attorney's fees should be up here. We're going to start with some California Supreme Court cases. And last year, in the Pulliam versus h &L automotive case, the California Supreme Court dealt with an issue that, where there was a division of opinion between the courts of appeal. In Lemon Law, Song Beverly, 
Act cases dealing with breach of implied warranty, things of that nature. It's very common that you have these car cases, lemon law cases. Somebody will buy a car from a used lot and there will be problems with it. And they will then have this remedy. And it's very common when people buy cars that they also finance it. They don't pay cash for it. And the it's also common that the used car dealers may go out of business. And so when the plaintiff has a case, it may be that their best chance of recovering damages is against the finance company who financed it. And in this particular case, Pulliam, the plaintiff had won at the trial court, got an, a, their damage award was 21,000, just under 22,000, but there was a 169,000 plus attorney fee award. And the finance companies always argue in these cases that under the FTC's holder rule, their, the recovery against them cannot exceed the amount paid by the debtor under their loan. Well, that could significantly limit the damages and the courts of appeal had been decided on that. Some courts of appeal in California said, yep, that's right. All you can get is what the borrower has paid so far under the financing. And other courts were starting to say, nope, you can get all your damages. And the Supreme Court in this case came down on the side of the finance company is liable for all the damages. And that was the decision in this case. So that actually was a significant decision that clear, clarified the law in that area. Mike, what do you got to tell us about here? Okay, well, our next slide is uh, Brennan versus Superior Court of Contra Costa County. Uh, this was a, uh, a lawsuit by a special education high school student against uh, uh, a, a co other students and a staff member for a sexual assault. Uh, the UNRU Act uh, has been the basis for a multitude of civil, lit civil litigation in California uh, having to do with uh, disabled parties access uh, to businesses uh, and whatnot. And in this case, the uh, the parties had settled the case, but the California Supreme Court took it upon himself to, to uh, uh, take the appeal despite the settlement and rule on a couple of issues, uh, mainly whether the school district was a business establishment for purposes of the UNRU, UNRU Act rights. And uh, that uh, act prohibits discrimination in uh, all business establishments of every kind whatsoever and the legislative intent in California was that uh, that is to be interpreted very, very broadly. But in this case, uh, the California Supreme Court in a unanimous decision held that the California public schools are not covered by the UNRU Civil Rights Act. Uh, and that was kind of a retrenching of uh, the trend which had uh, always been a uh, broad availability of civil rights remedies uh, in the state uh, per the statutory framework. So this was uh, a very interesting case in that the uh, Supreme Court uh, made that decision that a school district is not uh, a business establishment covered under the UNRU Act. Great. Okay, our next case is going to deal with the recreational use immunity and uh, under the civil code, Hoffman versus Young. For years, it's been the law in California that if you have somebody who goes on under somebody's property and they get injured, in general, they may not, the landowner may not be liable. However, there's an exception under civil code section 846 D3 that says, if there is an invitation, then the immunity does not apply. And in this case, the son of the people who own the property invited a friend, uh, a young woman, to come and do some motorcycle riding on the property. And unfortunately, she started going around the track and was seriously injured. Now, in this case, the Court of Appeal had decided that uh, there was an invitation by the son that activated the exception. So there was no immunity. 
but the court of the supreme court said nope that's not going to be the rule here and the supreme court said that you have to you can have liability if you show that either a landowner or an agent acting on his or her behalf extended an express invitation to come out of the property and the record in this case did not show that the son was authorized to extend the invitation to his parents so the exception to the immunity did not apply okay mike all right the next case we have is uh geyser versus coons um and uh, th this involved a it's an anti-slap uh uh case there was a sidewalk picket against a real estate company's business practices after the company evicted two long-term residents uh, from their homes and the court of appeal had held that the activity at issue was beyond the scope of the anti-slap protection uh, concluding that the picket did not implicate a public issue and concerned only a private dispute between the company and the residents that it had uh, evicted. Uh, the California Supreme Court, um, in reliance on a recent decision uh, uh, they had come up with recent, I say 2019, uh, in the case of Filmon.com Inc. versus Double Verify, uh, where they had set forth a, a two-pronged test as to what is covered under the anti-slap uh, statute. And uh, um, they uh, um, they reviewed uh, that and they determined that uh, under a, a proper application of the Filmon's two-part test, uh, uh, they found that the sidewalk protest constitutes protected activity within the meaning of the statute, and therefore is covered by the anti-slap uh, statute in California which is civil uh, code of civil procedure uh 425.16 sub now i take slap cases are very common every year it comes up all the time that's a slap was first passed in 1992 and this law has certainly evolved probably far beyond what anybody would have thought uh in that kind of a situation uh the next case is another anti-slap case this is olson versus doe and this is an interesting application where there was a mediation and a mediation agreement in the context of a uh harassment hearing civil harassment hearing under code of civil procedure 527.6 now there was a people who lived in the same apartment complex and this guy was harassing this woman she brought this harassment action at the trial hearing the judge said go try to settle this and they made an agreement and they agreed to settle the harassment claim and they agreed there was going to be no disparagement in her writing and so the guy kept harassing her so she later sues him in an action in the uh, co trial court and then he as a defendant brought this anti-slap motion saying hey you're violating this anti-disparagement agreement that we made and therefore i want to get this anti-slap motion to knock out your case and um, what the court of appeal said is the non-disparagement clause in that agreement does not apply to statements made by the woman in the litigation context and the anti-slap motion should, uh, actually she filed the anti-slap motion, should be granted because the plaintiff could not show a probability of success on the merits. And this is uh, another example where you've got uh, application of an anti-slap. And now the one thing the court did not decide in this particular case is whether the litigation privilege would apply to these particular claims. So Mike, let's go to Siegel versus ASICS. This particular case has to do whether costs incurred in preparing photocopies of exhibits and demonstrative uh, evidence exhibits for trial are recoverable um, as a recoverable cost if you prevail in the action. And uh, this court 
there have been some conflicts in decisions uh, up to this point uh, as to whether or not photocopies of trial and demonstrative exhibits are recoverable costs if they're not actually used in the trial. And uh, the California Supreme Court decided to intervene here and determine that such costs are recoverable and may be awarded in the trial court's discretion. So they're not they're not categorically recoverable as a matter of every time, but in the trial court's discretion, they can Correct. be recovered. Correct. Okay. Here we go to an employment case. And as I said, there are a lot of cases in employment each year by the California courts. Lawson versus PPG Architectural finishes. This deals with a whistleblower retaliation claim. And it's quite common for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal to pose a question to the California Supreme Court about how the Supreme Court would rule in California on an unemployment issue. And that's what happened in this case. And answering that question, the Supreme Court determined the proper method for presenting and evaluating a claim of whistleblower retaliation under Labor Code Section 1102.5. And what they decided the Supreme Court said once an employee whistleblower establishes by a preponderance of the evidence that retaliation was a contributing factor in the employee's termination, demotion, or other adverse action, then the employer bears the burden of demonstrating by clear and convincing evidence, and that's a much higher standard, that it would have taken the same action for legitimate independent reasons. So uh, that was a new important finding in the employment area. And Mike, you got another employment case here. Yes, uh, Naranjo versus Spectrum Security Services. Uh, this is another wage and hour case of uh, favoring uh, the employees. Um, in this particular case, the Supreme Court found that the additional hour of pay uh, that is uh, uh, required uh, if someone misses a meal break or a rest period break constitutes wages and therefore must be reported on the required wage statements. So accordingly, this uh, case uh, not only um, uh, allows um, uh, it, it basically uh, allows additional recoveries on wage statement violations based on the fact that uh, premium pay for missed meal or rest breaks, if it's not reported on the required wage statement, that's a wage statement violation and uh, will allow uh, additional recovery for on the wage statement or late payment penalties once the employee uh, separates from the employer. And another wrinkle in this case is the Supreme Court decided that uh, the interest rate that should be applied in this situation pre is a 7% prejudgment interest rate. That's it's correct. That's failure correct. to make those uh, yeah. payments. The, inter the interest rate on the, uh, the amounts payable for failure to provide meal or, or for, for meal or rest break violations is the prejudgment interest is or is seven percent right so now we're going to go to an evidence case and in this case in uh barrow turan versus superior court um, the court of appeal had ruled that it was proper to allow a discovery deposition testimony from an earlier action because it felt it was admissible under the hearsay exception in evidence code section 1291A2. Now, this is another example. The parties had settled the case, but the Supreme Court decided to go ahead and issue its ruling to decide an issue of importance. And what the Supreme Court said is they said evidence code section 1291 a2 actually creates a general rule against the admission of testimony from prior civil discovery. Doesn't mean it's 
never admissible, but the general rule is it's not going to be admissible. And then the Supreme Court said, if you're going to, the trial court's going to consider allowing it, it has to follow the, the following approach. It should determine whether the parties intended at the outset that the deposition would serve as trial testimony. It should also determine whether the parties subsequently reached an agreement concerning use of the deposition at trial in that earlier case or in other cases. Other key practical considerations are the timing of the deposition within the context of the litigation, special circumstances creating an incentive for cross-examination, the relationship of the deponent and the opposing party, the anticipated availability of the deponent at trial, and the proceeding in which the deposition was taken, etc. I mean, as you can imagine, there's all kinds of situations where a discovery deposition is taken. Let's say if it's a former employee and that former employee may be in a good relationship with a former employer, uh, if the plaintiff uh, attorney in the in employment case has taken the depo, the employer may not want to take any, ask any questions. So it's, it's generally not going to be admissible, but under certain circumstances, if the trial court does the analysis the Supreme Court says, they could become admissible. Next case is Mike, we're going to talk about medical malpractice, even though the micro statute's been around since 1995. Here we have in 2022, a, a new decision dealing with micro. Yep. The California Supreme Court weighs in again. Uh, uh, as uh, you may know, California medical malpractice cases have a $250,000 cap on pain and suffering and other non-economic damages. Here, the issue is whether that cap also applies to actions against a physician assistant who are nominally supervised by a doctor but receive minimal or no actual supervision when performing medical services. The Supreme Court held that the cap does apply to the negligence of a physician's assistant who has, legally who has a legally enforceable agency relationship with a supervising physician and provide services within the scope of that agency relationship, even if the physician violates his or own her obligation to provide adequate supervision. Now, for those of you who practice in the area of torts and medical malpractice, you probably already know that last year there was a compromise reach between the plaintiff's bar and the defense bar, and the micro rules are changing starting this year and for the next 10 years, there's going to be increases in the amount of damages allowed under MICRA for non-economic damages. Now, this next case deals with a partnership issue, and this is a very interesting wrinkle, I thought. This was a case in Siri Investment versus, I don't know if I know how to pronounce this name, Firkin Han Depor. And good try, Monty. Yeah, it's the best I can do. Supreme Court affirmed in part and reversed in part the Court of Appeals decision in this case where the plaintiff had alleged fraudulent diversion of partnership profits. Now, there had been an earlier appeal, cases were remanded back to the trial court, defendants failed to respond to discovery even after being ordered to do so. Trial court ended up issuing an order granting terminating sanctions and striking the defense answers and entering their default and later issued a default judgment against defendants. Now, this total sum of the judgment was $12 million. Um, included in that was interest of almost a million, treble damages of $2.8 million pursuant to Penal Code Section 496C punitive damages of 4 million, attorney's fees of 4 million. So the California Supreme Court addressing conflicts in the courts of appeal made two important rulings. Number one, a party in default, because this these defendant was in default, has standing to file a motion for a new trial asserting error relating to the calculation of damages so they could appeal. But it also ruled that a trial court may award treble damages and attorney's fees under Penal Code Section 496C 
in a case involving, and that is usually thought of because it's talking about trafficking in stolen goods. But the Supreme Court said that penal code section applies also to fraudulent diversion of partnership cash distributions. So this is a whole new potential recovery of significant treble damages and attorney's fees in partnership disputes. Now we're going to go to the courts of appeal and Mike's going to start with an arbitration case. Um, a lot of these arbitration cases, uh, this is an evolving uh, area of the law still. Uh, basically, I call this case the case that arbitration clauses may not be enforceable against poor plaintiffs. Uh, this was a legal malpractice case. Uh, the trial court had granted uh, the defendant's petition to compel arbitration and stayed the lawsuit pending the conclusion of the arbitration. Uh, the plaintiff sought to lift the stay on the basis that he could not afford to pay the arbitration fees. There had been a split of authority on whether a trial court may lift a stay under these circumstances. Here, the appellate court, first district, um, uh, resolved that issue by determining that the trial court has discretion to lift the stay where a plaintiff demonstrates financial inability to pay the anticipated arbitration costs. Under such circumstances, the court held that the trial court must give the defendant a choice whether to pay the plaintiff's share of the arbitration costs or agree to lift the stay and effectively waive the right to arbitration. So this is one of those cases where compelling arbitration against a poor person who probably can't pay their fair share um, um, uh, uh, is gonna be, you're gonna ultimately be required to either forego the right to arbitration or agree to pay the plaintiff's share of arbitration costs. Yeah, and um, one of the areas that I see all the time in terms of published opinions, there are a lot of published opinions every year in this arbitration area. Sometimes we're dealing with, this case had the wrinkle of, you know, can you send it back to the trial court because of financial issues, but it can also be enforceability. Is it uh, unconscionable procedurally and substantively? Our next case is going to be another arbitration case. And there's just about as many arbitration cases every year as there are employment cases. So they're very common. De Leon versus Juanita's Foods. In this case, uh, the Court of Appeal affirmed the trial court's order after the commencement of arbitration proceedings between plaintiff and defendant. So the case was compelled to arbitration. And after those arbitration proceedings started, there was billing from the agency, uh, the provider, and the arbitration costs were required to be paid within 30 days. The defendant did not pay them within the 30-day time period. And the Court of Appeal concluded that the trial court had correctly ruled that the defendant was in material breach of the arbitration agreement and therefore it had lost its right to arbitration. The case was sent back to trial. There have been several of these decisions decided in 2022, and I believe even some this year in 2023. So if the defendant gets a case sent to arbitration, they sure as heck better pay immediately the bill for arbitration fees. Otherwise, if you don't do so timely, you're liable to be going back to the trial court. Okay, now we've got an attorney fee case, Mike. Uh, yeah, this is, our, this is the fourth district uh, uh, decision. Uh, this involves a public works construction project where the contractor had posted a payment bond and uh, the um, uh, contractor had entered into an agreement with the uh, bonding company to defend and indemnify it uh, against any loss on the bond. So when the subcontractor sued on the bond, the bonding company tendered its defense to the contractor who ended up paying all the attorney's fees and costs. In fact, they used 
the uh, uh, contractor's own attorney to defend the bonding company. Following the confirmation of an arbitration award where the bonding company was determined to be the prevailing party, the bonding company filed a motion to recover attorney's fees and costs. And the trial judge held that while the bonding company did qualify as the prevailing party, it was not entitled to an award of attorney's fees because in a cost because the contractor had paid all the fees and costs. The appellate court reversed, finding that a party represented by counsel is entitled uh, to um, uh, recover attorney's fees uh, and costs, even if they have or those will be borne by a third party. All right, that's interesting interesting rule in there we'll see what happens if uh, any other cases come up with that now this uh melinda's case is uh, another example and this came out in january of 2022 and you remember we talked as our first supreme court case a case that came out i believe it was in may of last year with the holder rule and this Melendez versus Westlake Services was another Lemon Law case, Song Beverly Act. And this Court of Appeal, and this time it was the Second District Court of Appeal in January of last year, came to the same conclusion that the Supreme Court ultimately did, which is under the Holder Rule, the financing company can be liable for uh, the complete amount uh, of this. Um, award so uh that's what this one is about so mike let's continue on okay uh this is a uh, the next case we have is cole versus superior court of san no Diego. wait a second i'm going to do this next one sorry cam carson llc versus carson reclamation authority uh, under the law you can sue an entity for alter ego and try to go after somebody who's uh, maybe the controller of a corporate entity or something. In this particular case, there was a lawsuit dealing with the city of Carson and the Carson Reclamation Authority. Now, the Reclamation Authority had entered into this uh, contract with the plaintiff, and the plaintiff sued the city and the Reclamation Authority, and this, they said the city should be liable under the theory of alter ego. Um, now, the Court of Appeal reversed the trial court's order. The trial court had said, no, I'm going to sustain a demur without leave to amend to this alter ego liability theory. And the Court of Appeal reversed that, and they said the alter ego doctrine may be applied to government entities where the facts justify an equitable finding of liability. And they concluded that the allegations in the plaintiff's second minute of complaint were sufficient to survive the city's demur. So that's interesting where you can go against a governmental entity for alter ego. So now we're going to get to the Cole case here, Mike. Okay. Tell us about that. You bet. Cole versus Superior Court of San Diego County. Uh, there, this was a summary judgment motion filed by the defense be just before trial, uh, but it was filed within the statutorily required time for filing of motions for summary judgment. However, uh, the court was unable to provide a hearing date prior to the trial date, um, and the first hearing date available was until about a week after the trial was scheduled to start. So the uh, defendant uh, asked for a continuance of the trial so that the motion could be heard. The court denied that. Uh, the defendant took a writ, and the appellate court ruled that because the motion had been filed within the statutorily required time, the defendant had the right to have their motion heard before trial. Yeah, and that was from a case down here in San Diego uh, with one of the local judges down here. So uh, I know other attorneys throughout the state have had this issue before, but this is a published opinion that's going to probably help parties 
if they timely file their motion, get their hearing before the trial date. Our next decision is going called the Ty versus Richmond City Center LP. Now this case deals with what if you serve subpoenas on non-parties to the case and they don't comply with the subpoena request, don't produce anything. So what is the time period within which you have to bring a motion? So in this case, the trial court had actually granted motions to compel compliance with consumer subpoenas and production of records requests. The plaintiff had served uh, consumer subpoena for deposition and production of documents on a non-party, the property manage, manager of this party called Richmond City Center. And they also subpoenaed production of business records from the accountant for Richmond. The no documents were produced and Richmond, the party, objected to both subpoenas. The plaintiff filed motions to compel under CCP 2025.480 and the trial court granted that, but the, the Court of Appeal reversed. Ruling on an issue of first impression, the Court of Appeal held that a subpoenaing party must bring a motion to enforce the subpoena within 20 days after the objection, and this is under 1985.3G. And after this 20-day deadline expires, the subpoenaing party cannot move to enforce a subpoena over the objection through a motion to compel. So, uh, they won at the trial court, but they were untimely filed and they lost at the Court of Appeal. So if you're going to subpoena non-parties, be aware that you may have a very short time fuse if you get objections to file something to try to compel comp compliance. Now we're going to deal with 998s, right, okay. Mike? Yep, another 998 case, uh, Trio versus City of L.A., this was a negligence case against the city of Los Angeles. The city made a 998 offer uh, to the plaintiff a few days before a hearing on the defendant's motion for summary judgment. Just four minutes after the court orally granted uh, defendant's summary judgment motion, plaintiff's counsel emailed a purported acceptance of the settlement offer to the city. The trial court entered judgment against the defendants, implicitly ruling that the plaintiff's acceptance was inoperative. The Court of Appeal affirmed that, uh, holding that because a dispute is resolved and the outcome of the litigation becomes certain and known, once a trial court issues its oral ruling granting summary judgment, that that is the point in time in which both, uh, in, in the point in time in which the 998 is no longer operative. So, you know, what's the lesson here? Timing is everything. Uh, uh, you can't accept a 998 after a court has indicated uh, that it's going to grant a motion for summary judgment. Yeah, this is just one example of 998 cases come up a lot in the published opinions because 998 can be a trap for the unwary. And we'll probably talk about some more 998 issues later but i can imagine the plaintiff's attorney here was probably thinking hey you get 30 days plus five days for mailing if you get a nine and eight they only serve this nine and eight a few days before i'll just go ahead and accept so you can't do that if you're going to be if you got a motion for summary judgment against you and you're concerned that the other side may win their motion you better accept that nine and eight before the court rules on it so now we're gonna to go to employment. And this is a case of LaFace versus Ralph's Grocery Company. One of the areas in employment where there's a lot of published cases is PAGA uh, and the Private Attorneys General Act. It's been around for a number of years, but there's a lot of cases continuing to tell us different things that apply in the PAGA situation. In this case, the Court of Appeal affirmed the trial court's judgment for defendant following a bench trial in plaintiff's PAGA action. And the 
plaintiff was arguing that they really had been denied a jury trial. They should have been given a jury trial. And the Court of Appeal decided, nope, the trial court properly concluded the PAGA action was equitable and the plaintiff was not entitled to a jury trial. And it also made the finding that the employees, the defendant was not required to provide seating for its cashiers in this case. So now we're going to go to an evidence case that I'll discuss. Uh, this it was an interesting wrinkle that I would not have expected. And you may want to be aware of this. Klein versus Zimmer, Inc. And this can happen, really be an issue in many, many tort cases. This happened to be a, an issue with um, product liability because the plaintiff in this case, following a jury trial, uh, had been awarded 80,000 in economic damages and 7.6 million in non-economic damages for a defective artificial joint that had been placed in the plaintiff. Now, during the trial, what happened was the trial judge excluded testimony from the defense expert witnesses because the defense witness was not able to state opinions to a reasonable medical probability. Now, generally the rule in any kind of a causation issue in dealing with medical evidence is somebody has to testify to a reasonable medical probability. What the Court of Appeal decided in this case is the trial judge erred when they excluded the testimony because the reasonable medical probability requirement applies only to the party bearing the burden of proof on the issue. So in this particular case, the plaintiff had the burden of proof. Their expert had to be able to talk about it to a reasonable medical probability, which their experts did. But the trial court erred, even though the defense expert could not say reasonable medical probability, that testimony should not have been allowed because they didn't have the burden of proof. So I thought that was quite an interesting decision that could apply to a lot of tort situations. Now we're going to go, Mike, to insurance and COVID. Yes, um, this uh, is one of the uh, cases arising out of a multitude of cases arising out of insurance claims by a business uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And the issue here was whether a business uh, that was ordered to close, this was a restaurant chain, or suspend operations could get compensation under uh, the business income coverage of the standard comprehensive commercial liability policy. The issue has generated opinions from different courts of appeal all over the state. Uh, all of which basically have held that the issue comes of coverage comes down to whether the insured can allege it suffered direct physical loss of or damage to the insured's property. Here, the first district determined that the mere loss of use of physical property to generate business income without any other physical damage or impact did not give rise to coverage for direct physical loss. All right, so it, I remember when COVID hit and everybody got shut down, there was a lot of publicity about all kinds of lawsuits being filed. And I've handled enough insurance issues over the years, both as a lawyer and a mediator, that I understand and knew that a lot of your commercial property cases require some kind of property damage. That's common language. and. That was going to be the case that would make it difficult. So in this case, Mike just talked about no allegation of actual property damage, so no coverage. Well, most of the cases have kind of gone the way of Appalachia so far, and we've seen more cases this year in 2023 dealing with this. But there's another uh, kind of way that some of these cases have come out, and this is what I'll discuss with Marina Pacific Hotel and Suites versus Fireman's Fund. In this case, the trial court has sustained the demur without leave to amend, finding 
no coverage because it felt there was really no actual damage. But the Supreme, the Court of Appeal reversed this case because it said in this situation, what the plaintiffs had alleged was that COVID-19 not only lives on the surfaces, but also bonds to the surfaces through physiochemical reactions involving cells and surface proteins, which transform the physical condition of the property and force plaintiffs to close their business on the property. And with those kinds of allegations, the Court of Appeals said the plaintiffs had adequately alleged direct physical loss or damage caused by COVID-19, and therefore they stated a cause of action. So what I think we're going to see is plaintiffs are going to become a little more sophisticated in how they're going to allege these uh, issues. And then the question is going to be a question of fact that has to be determined, you know, uh, and maybe a question of science to some degree. Well, Monty, we... I, yeah, I was going to ask, who are the experts that are going to testify this? It sounds like the mold cases that we went through uh, for years and years, where the question is, do we have an expert who can testify that the property is damaged as a result of clean COVID? Yeah, and that's going to be a good question. Is there is there the right kind of expert that can talk about it? Now, the next case I'll talk about is a case dealing with legal malpractice, but this was an interesting case to me. I have actually thought before years before this came out last year in April, 2022, that um, lawyers should be very careful before they're filing a complaint for a plaintiff to discuss with their client the risk of having an anti-slap motion filed against the complaint. Because as you know, if you get an anti-slap motion filed and it's won by the defendant, the case is over very quickly and the plaintiff may have to pay attorney's fees to the defendant. And this is a case that all attorneys should be very aware of because this talks about an obligation and a duty that we have. So in this case, the Court of Appeal reversed in part and affirmed in part the trial court's order that granted defendants a motion for summary judgment to plaintiff's complaint against his former lawyers for professional negligence and breach of fiduciary duty, et cetera. The complaint alleged that the defendants, the lawyers had failed to advise the plaintiff, who's a lawyer from the UK himself, of California's anti-slap statute before filing a complaint on plaintiff's behalf against a newspaper publisher in California federal court. And the plaintiff alleged the lawsuit predictably drew a successful anti-slap motion to strike, which caused plaintiff to incur substantial attorney's fees litigating and losing the motion and deprived him of discovery he intended to use in a disciplinary proceeding pending against him in the United Kingdom, ultimately resulting in the loss of his law license, substantial fines and fees, and bankruptcy. Now, part, uh, the Court of Appeal decision agreed with the trial court that the plaintiff's damages claim based upon the adverse outcome in the UK action was too speculative to create a question of fact for the jury. But those weren't the plaintiff's only damages. The trial court erred in concluding that the plaintiff could not establish causation under the case within a case method. The court of appeal concluded that an attorney owes a duty of care to advise a client of foreseeable risks of litigation before filing a lawsuit on the client's behalf and therefore plaintiff alleged a viable claim that but for defendant's negligent failure to advise him of the risks of an anti-slap motion, he would not have filed his lawsuit in California and would not have incurred damages from litigating and losing an anti-slap motion. So if you haven't been warned about this case by your, medic, uh, by your legal malpractice insurer, be aware of this and definitely you wanna warn clients if you're thinking about starting a plaintiff's action where you might get an anti-slap. So 
Mike, what do we have here in this case with Pacific Grove? Uh, Pacific Grove, this is a short-term rental case. Um, I call it the short-term rental owners fought the law and the law won. Uh, we know that the market for um, short-term rentals, uh, vacation uh, resorts by owners, Airbnb and other short-term rentals have boomed in California. And despite their popularity, uh, they've become under attack by various municipal ordinances that limit how a short-term rental can be used, or they prohibit them altogether. So property owners affected by these ordinances often bring legal challenges um, uh, to no avail, as reflected in this particular case. Here, the city uh, of uh, Pacific Grove adopted a series of ordinances regulating short-term rentals. One ordinance required annual licensure, um, and then and another ordinance imposed a cap on the number of licenses, and by random lottery, the city selected 50 short-term rental licenses that would not be renewed. Now, the plaintiffs were on the losing end of this lottery, and they sued the city, arguing that the, they had a vested right uh, uh, property right to have their license renewed and that the, the uh, non-renewal of their short-term license violated their due process rights. The appellate court uh, um, first rejected uh, plaintiff's argument that they had a fundamental right to operate a short-term rental and concluded that the ordinance's cap on the number of licenses was not arbitrary and or unreasonable because it furthered the city's goal of maintaining its residential character. So the way I see it, this case kind of offers a roadmap to various cities on how they can approach and regulate uh, the short-term rental market. And, uh, and I think we're going to be seeing um, a lot more of uh, these types of uh, uh, lawsuits having to do over various city uh, ordinances that have been and will be adopted in the future. Yeah, that's been a uh, short-term rentals have been a hot topic for several years, and now we see it in the area of the published opinions. So our next case uh, deals with settlement. Now, one of the things that I, uh, and I think Mike and anybody who does mediation, is always gonna be concerned about. If you have a settlement of a case, and if the case is going to involve payments over time, it's quite common for the parties to say, well, let's work out some kind of a stipulated judgment or something where, you know, if, if you default, uh, a judgment can be entered, and then there's gonna be so much that's gonna be paid. Well, one of the problems you gotta be careful is you don't wanna run afoul of the penalties provision that would make such a settlement unenforceable under civil code section 1671b because let's say you had a case where there was a hundred thousand um, dollar settlement and the parties want to incentivize the defendant to pay and they said hey if you default you got a judgment for 150,000 with well, the damages in the case were a hundred thousand and then you got a stipulated judgment for 150, you're probably gonna be found to have created a penalty. And at first blush, and if it's a penalty, it's settlement and stipulated judgment is not enforceable. In Gormley versus Gonzalez, at first blush, I was thinking, may maybe this is gonna be a penalty. What happened here is the Court of Appeal affirmed the trial court's order granting a motion to enforce a settlement agreement now the judgment against the defendants was in the total amount of 1.393084 uh, over almost 1.4 million dollars the settlement amount was 575,000 and then there was over 800,000 dollars in liquidated damages well at first blush i was a little concerned that's a lot of liquidated damages but when you look at the facts of the case, the plaintiffs were 
parties in 20 separate medical malpractice lawsuits filed against two doctors and a medical spa. And the defendants in those lawsuits resolved the underlying lawsuits by entering into a global settlement agreement. And under that agreement, defendants agreed to pay plaintiffs $575,000 in two installments. If the installments were not paid on time, the agreement provided liquidated damages would be assessed at the rate of $50,000 per month or $1,644 per day up to a cap of $1.5 million. Now, the trial court properly rejected the defendant's argument that the liquidated damages was unreasonable and thus invalid under Civil Code Section 1671B. The Court of Appeal found that the trial court had properly considered all of the circumstances existing at the time the settlement was negotiated, and it concluded the defendants failed to meet their burden of establishing any kind of unreasonableness or a penalty. Here's what were important factors that led to that conclusion. The parties were represented by counsel throughout the settlement negotiations. The liquidated damages provision involves significant negotiations and numerous drafts. The parties estimated that the plaintiff's recovery at trial would be 1.5 million. So they agreed that would be the damages recovered. But the problem was defendants only had insurance covering six out of the 20 lawsuits. And of course, that creates a big problem. Uh, and the plaintiffs therefore agreed to accept a significantly reduced settlement amount of the 575,000, but they wanted to have assurances the defendants would be able to pay that amount quickly. So this whole liquidated damages provision was negotiated in order to incentivize prompt payment and the damages were capped at 1.5 million, the amount the parties estimated the parties would have recovered at trial. So whenever you're going to have some kind of a stipulated judgment and payments over time, make sure your deal for the stipulated judgment is what the damages would be. And that's what made this thing enforceable. So our next case here is Cleveland. This is a case dealing with the immunity under government code section 855.6 this is a school shooting case and the court of appeal affirmed a judgment for defendants um, following a jury trial uh, no a judgment against defendants following a jury trial concluding that the school district employees were 54 percent at fault for injuries suffered by the plaintiff who was shot in the stomach by another student using a shotgun, which resulted in the school district being vicariously liable for over $2 million in damages. The defendants were trying to claim their conduct was protected by the immunity in government code section 855.6, but the court of appeal in an issue of first impression uh, said that the specific acts and omissions identified by the plaintiff's expert is below the standard of care for conducting a threat assessment were properly characterized as administrative and not as a mental examination. And therefore, those negligent acts and omissions fell outside of the scope of the immunity under the government code. And there was also substantial evidence to support the jury finding according to the Court of Appeal, because there was a failure of campus supervisor to report a conversation about other employees, and they were so afraid of this kid who became the shooter, they had escape plans before this event happened. So now we're gonna to go to uh, last two cases we're gonna talk about, and Mike, tell us about 998 in this PM right. case. In this particular case, uh, the defendant made a 998 offer that included a statement that said the parties will execute a settlement and release providing that the plaintiff will satisfy all liens, uh, execute a civil code section 1542 waiver, and there will be no admission of liability by the defendant. 
uh, following trial, a plaintiff's verdict did not exceed the 998 offer, but the trial court ruled that the 998 uh, offers, there were several uh, plaintiffs, were invalid since the settlement and release agreement referred to was not attached to the offer. So, and the court ruled that while a 998 may contain a demand for a release of claims, this particular 998 offer included a demand for a settlement agreement that was not attached or described in detail. Uh, and hence, uh, the court included that the offer was too ambiguous uh, to be enforceable. So I guess the lesson is, if you're going to talk about releasing uh, uh, or signing a settlement agreement as part of the 998 offer, you better attach it. You better attach it. So uh, we've got this one last case, Hayward. I know we're at one, so we're going to be finished up here in just a second here. This last case, um, Unuzetia versus a Copian. This is a case that's going to affect any kinds of a civil trial. Uh, this was dealing with the Batson-Wheeler challenges. Now, historically, uh, Batson-Wheeler challenge in terms of somebody trying to challenge or throw off potential jurors, you can challenge that under Batson-Wheeler if you're trying to say that they were acting based upon some kind of a racial bias. And this was uh, a medical malpractice action where the defendant won at the jury trial, but it was the second appeal in the case. The first appeal, the Court of Appeal had held that the trial court erred in denying the plaintiff's Batson-Wheeler motion, challenging the defendant's peremptory challenge to six Hispanic potential jurors and not requiring defense counsel to offer non-discriminatory reasons for his first four challenges. On remand, the trial court asked that he justifications of the defense attorney. And as to two, the defense attorney said they were excused because they had a family member who was disabled. And the attorney feared the family member's disability would cause the juror to be biased in favor of plaintiff, who had alleged she'd become disabled due to the negligence of the doctor. The trial court found the justifications were race neutral and denied the Batson-Wheeler motion. And then it goes up to the Court of Appeal a second time. And in this appeal, the Court of Appeal ruled the trial court erred. And the reason it erred in denying the Batson-Wheeler motion is while historically it's been dealing with race, in 2015, the legislature expanded the scope of cogniz cognizable groups protected under Batson-Wheeler by enacting um, some assembly bills that changed CCP 231.51 with reference to government code section 1113.5 to say, and this is a critical thing, peremptory challenges cannot be used to excuse prospective jurors on the basis of their sex, race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, ethnic group identification, age, mental and physical disability, medical condition, origin, ethnic group identification, genetic information, marital status, or sexual orientation. Nor, said the Court of Appeal, can a peremptory challenge be based on the perception the juror possesses one of these characteristics or because of the juror's association with someone perceived to have one of these characteristics. So as you can imagine in civil trials, this case may really have an impact upon jury selection and objections that can be raised. And Hayward, as we close this out, I just wanna let folks know they've got the handouts. I think they've been sent in the chat. And if anybody is interested in getting some more information about the case summaries I provide with California case summaries, there's a reference on the beginning of the slides. You just go to https colon backslash backslash cacasesummaries.com. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure to share this with you. And Mike and I wish everybody all the best as we 
get into the summer and finish up the year. ADR Services, Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services, Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront, woman-owned and operated from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.